So hello, um, my name is Ashley William Mills. I was a um, previous student here about three year, coming three years ago now, doing this very course that you're doing in Celtic Studies, um, learning Gaelic culture, um, Celtic history of ancient and modern. Um, and this all this sort of talk of midwinter folklore and Christmas traditions all came from last year when I was pleased to be and invited by Carol herself to do a talk and then asked again to do this year. Um, which is basically the same sort of talk but a few little tweaks on the way that I've added. Um, and I'm at the moment studying Scottish ethnology and Scottish history at Edinburgh University. Um, and for those that are not familiar with the term with ethnology, it is basically the study of ethnicity in a culture. So stuff like belief systems, um, customs, uh, religious beliefs, um, sort of the cultural base of like their traditions and their belief systems. And so today I'm going to be talking about we want to folklore and history of Christmas traditions. And a lot of Christmas traditions that you have today are reconstructions or borrowed um, from different cultures. And a lot of people um, will find that um, through this presentation today. So as you can see through some of the introductions, the pictures that you're all familiar with and maybe some new ones, um, you know, the, the Christmas tree, the wreath, decking the halls, um, I'm not quite sure, I've seen a lot of people doing this now with stockings, um, the Yule log, and then a nice new tradition which I think is amazing and sweet for the kids is the Naughty Elf, uh, which I do for my partner's kids myself. So. I want to what Christmas used to be in Graham. Now, what you see today, like I was saying, that Christmas tree, the wreath, deck in the halls, they're relatively modern adoption to Britain, but come from stem from older roots through Germanic um, culture and Scandinavia. So before that, um, there was a tradition called like Lord Misrule or um, you go guys in and this was a tradition that was banned um, Christmas was banned for quite some while when Oliver Cromwell was in rule of Britain and parts of uh, Scotland as well and basically essentially it would be this idea again with this gift, gift given however it would be more of an idea of ransom so you'd have this character here which is known as Lord Misrule and he would have a band of men, they would all be guys that you wouldn't know who they were. And essentially these would have been the poorer people of society. And it gave them a chance to sort of go around the much upper class um, houses and ransack the house. They would um, put people at ransom. They would um, blackmail them if they didn't give them a gift of some kind of food. That they would essentially would probably rob the house, cause all sorts of havoc. Um, I've included one of the traditional um, chants which was sung, which is Lord Miss Raw in the midst of your sports, in one of the sort to put all of the sorts, and, let, and swallow you whole when almost visible, and after will bring up the party invisible. Now, in, the, in this sort of passage, this chant, what it's essentially saying that the Lord of Miss Raw's role is to turn everything upside down. So, what is up is now down. What is black now is forward. So in this century, like the rich become the poor and the poor become the rich. And this is led by the Lord of Misrule as the main procession. And there'll be all sorts of music going on um, and all ruckus. Sometimes it would probably get a bit violent as well. Um, especially if you had like a lord or a lord or um, someone who of high society that wasn't going to accept the tradition then they essentially would break through windows, go through your house and ransack the house full of all goods that's worth it, well worth something. Um, and this was banned again, like I said, through for some hundred years actually, Christmas traditions, um, through the rule of Oliver Cromwell. He essentially was, again, like it was a time where um, Protestantism was sort of within reign of most of the British Isles. Um, and Protestant was sort of stripping back these traditions which were deemed pagan or um, a bit savage-like. 
Um, and he wants to, Protestantism wants to strip that idea of that and just based on passage and Bible study as opposed to folk customs or folk belief because um, they were deemed as superstitious and therefore were not the teachings of God or Jesus Christ. So, what we'll go on next is what we all know of today is the Christmas tree. Now, the Christmas tree and the whole idea of Christmas we have today and a, a turkey or goose as they would have in Victorian times was introduced by the idea of Charles Dickens, you must have all know a Christmas carol, you know, the, there's a free ghosts because it's Scrooge and that's where the word humble comes from and it's that reinvention of sort of a, a new Christmas tradition at a time where uh, it was quite a romantic era the Victorian so they were they were sort of looking to older traditions reinventing them and romanticizing this kind of almost like this pagan past or this or most folklorists early folklorists termed it a savagery like you know the beliefs of the savagery or the peasants um, so that's the idea of Christmas like and you sit down decking the halls first come through with Charles Dickens again then coming with the, the idea of having a Christmas tree up was first introduced by Queen Victoria and Albert they came from the, the Handel, um, Handelian succession from, from the family and their family roots were mainly Germanic so in Germany and they in Germany and many parts of different northern European uh, cultures it stems back this long tradition of bringing evergreens into your home and the idea that you know um, we, although we think it's dying outside and the crops have all brought in and but it's that idea of bringing something living ever like ever youthful or is to promote that fertility going for next year so with the Queen Victoria and Albert, they would have been like brought up these traditions of having a tree in your home and, and as you can see back then, with no electricity, these would be placed with candles, these would be like little gifts, mostly like sort of shrunned popcorn or berries as well, or apples. Um, it's quite alarming because these kind of trees or uh, Douglas ferns, um, are quite flammable. They have a an oil in it which is flammable. So to have little tiny candles in there, the fatality rates would have been quite high. Um, so it's it's quite alarming at times, but people still continue to do these traditions. And then so after that, this is the traditional picture that was drawn of the introduction of the Christmas tree to Britain by Queen Victoria and Albert. By the 1800s, 1880s, sorry, most of British Britain, or at least some of the middle and upper class, adopted this tradition of having a tree in your home, or evergreens. And like I said, I'll go back to the symbology of the tree. So it is speculated by most folklorists or historians that the tree and the reef is sort of have its familiars with the maple. I don't know if anyone's familiar with maypole dancing yeah, and so Christians yeah and so Christians like um, in Sweden do it as well um, I believe Britain's a little bit different with you've got a whole range of like dancing and ribbons and and gardens at the top but uh, it's believed that this having your Christmas tree in the roof is in fact fertility symbol so as you can see the tree represents the phallic symbol and then your reef obviously represents the more womanly genitals and with the same idea of maypole then being joined together means that you're promoting fertility of the land so with this time of year Christmas by winter and everything is dormant and then all the crops are in there's still that fear of well to, to back then the fear of like will there be fatalities with the, the crops will they fail will will cattle die um, so there's, it's, we're living in a world where there's a lot of uncertainty for the coming year. Like now we have pesticides and all sorts of things and genetic modified um, crops. And so our likelihood of like crop failure is, is a lot hot, like lower than it was back then. 
But it's that, it's that idea of promoting that, that sort of synthetic magic. Because we live in a, still in the, up into the 1800s, magic wasn't something to belief. It was something of quite reality. Like people believed in magic. People practiced forms of folk magic. There was people that were specialised in magic, like for cunning folk or wise women. So these were all, everyone did that in their homes and promote that, you know, we'll put these up and fertility will once again rain next year and we'll have better crops or at least no failure crops. So then we'll go on to another sort of common themes, which probably most of you probably already know, is that it's top in the tree. So um, a lot of what you either have the star which is the top, which represents the northern star, and which the three magi or the three wise men followed to find baby Jesus, or you have an angel which represents Gabriel who spread the word of Jesus' birth. The next is the Christmas ball, which is quite curious. A lot of people have said to me, was like, why have these balls? Like, they, they seem pretty and the glittery, and, and I'm like, yes, they, as much as they are, and they're brilliant when you put them. Um, you know, your lights on and the glitter, but they have much more of a, a deeper, again, belief system of witches and, and ghosts um, and fairies, because around this time, as we've all just had the Halloween festival just passed, and some of you may know that stems to older beliefs where the worlds are sort of thin at this time between the spirit world and this world. So, but their beliefs, not just for Halloween, it carries on right through winter, because winter is a time where sort of it's it's the opposite world. So it's like winter is a time where you can potentially be a character. It's, it's the world is thin from this world we live in. Um, so that means potential attacks as well. So potential attacks of belief in witches, you know, that, that might smite you with spells or bewitch you. The belief that fairies could come into your home and cause all sorts of havoc and take away your bad look, like your good look, or the look of the home. And so at this time, I mean, these stem from what is known as a witch ball. Now, here you have an example, which is at the Museum of Witchcraft and Magic, that's situated in Cornwall. And this is a, six, a 19th century witch ball. And the idea is that if you had something reflective in your house, it would be able to sort of confuse the spirits or at least fascinate them. So instead of going to you, like, they may, the spirit might see you walking about and they're like, right, I'm gonna attack them, right? So they go into the house and instead of like, attacking, they're sort of distracted by this, this, this glittery ball, their own reflection, and eventually they'll, they'll get confused and sort of forget what their original plan was and they're essentially <laughs> just sort of out of your house. Um, and a lot of people, um, if you were rich enough, you would have them made for you at baths. But amongst the average folks that were working class or would not have as much money, they would use a um, fishing float. So when the fishermen had sort of um, had a, a fishing float that's cracked or the ropes would no longer be prepared, repaired, um, they would essentially use a fishing float instead. But amongst the people that could afford it would have this grand big witch ball. And essentially this what stems through from the, the, um, the Christmas ball ball is again it's like not only we want to sort of reinforce that fertility, that life ever growing sort of magic into the home, but also it being a, a woodland thing, something you've brought from the house, you might potentially bring in something that's not so good. So a certain fairy or a certain spirit that might attach to that sort of land and essentially you don't want them to sort of wreak havoc so you would put little time. I don't think they would have had as many because depending on how rich and poor you were, um, they would have a few definitely just to sort of award the benevolent spirits. So our next tradition as you all know is like kissing under the mistletoe um, and a lot of people um, still do that in offices and homes and whatnot. I believe I watched in the news recently that there was a discussion that Scotland was debating about having it sort of banned 
in the workroom because they it seemed deemed inappropriate. Um, and I suppose it could be for those you know who of that intention to be like, right, this is my chance to sort of kiss that person and be inappropriate. But I'm a believer in tradition, so as I think. As long as you've got a choice of it. Exactly, as long as it's monitored, as long as there's like there's rules, like, you know, there's laws and regulations out there which protect you from sexual harassment. Um, but on the debate, like I think on this morning show, I think um, I agreed with this woman that was from the heritage sector, and she was saying, well, no, like if we start um, looking at these ideas where it could be potential tools for people that are like devious and stuff then essentially these traditions will just disappear and what we need in place really is to ensure that regulations are reinforced in the workplace and not tradition be banned which i kind of agree but um yeah so the ideas of mistletoe stems back for quite an ancient one and it is was first recorded by the roman historian Rudy the elder in the first century and it was loaded that the Celtic Druids would collect them at this time of year because it was seen as a magical um, plant really. You know, the idea that, that this plant doesn't grow on the ground, that it grows from trees, it grows nearest to the heavens. <coughs> There's also the folk magic I believe, um, idea that anything that doesn't touch earth will have this maintain the magical qualities of that object so of a plant or a, um, a branch so first recordings of of this this gathering of mistletoe comes from that and it says we should not amend to mention the great admiration that the Gauls have there as well the druids that as we call as their magicians hold nothing more sacred than the mistletoe and a tree in which growing providing this is hard timbered oak mistletoe is rare and when it's found it is gathered in great ceremony and particularly on the sixth day of the month hailing the moon in a native word that means healing all things they prepare a ritual sacrifice and a banquet beneath the tree and they bring up two white bulls whose horns are bound for the first time on this occasion a priest arrayed in white vests and links the tree and with a golden sickle puts down the mistletoe which is caught in a white cloth a white cloak. Then finally they kill the victims, praying to a god to render their gifts prosperous to, to those in which whom he bestowed them. They believe that mistletoe in drink will impart fertility to all animals, that is very barren, and that it is the antidote to all poisons. Now, with this here as well, like so it means in the native tongue it all heals, um, there is don't quote me on this, but there is a word in Gaelic called mistletoe, which actually translates as all heal. And also, um, in certain parts of England and Scotland, they call it the all healing plant. So it is believed to, once you have this charm, you know, you will never have be poisoned. You'll never overgo any illness throughout the year. Um, and, was, and still long through to, you know, the 19th century, like mistletoe was guarded as a, a sacred and a powerful amulet against all harm. Um, the idea of kissing under it, again, we're not can't be sure, but it's that idea of fertility. So, um, and one thing that denotes its fertility is because the berries resemble semen. So it has that fertility quality in it. So when you kiss your partner underneath it, you're essentially bestowing and your first love the fact that you, you'll receive a child in the next year. So that's where the idea is of kissing under the mistletoe comes from. Think about that next time you have a kiss under the mistletoe. <laughs> yeah, just think, well, I'm going, <laughs> you're going to put that ring on that finger first. <laughs> <coughs> so next thing is probably you. Again, it's become, this one's becoming a little less known that I've seen from the hosts along with the, the stockings is the Yule Log and however you, you probably most see it in the form of a, a chocolate cake it's normally a swish roll that's covered in, in chocolate and powdered um, shot bites and sugar and whatnot um, 
And then essentially before that, it was used, it's used for decoration purposes. So you would have like a large decorated pine coin cone, light up candles. However, this again stems to a much older tradition, a tradition which is more kept within the upper classes. And that is because not a lot of people could afford timber to burn throughout the winter months. Uh, a lot of people choose what they is called ash faggots or um, bundle of wood that's tied, or um, they would use turf um, or peat because it's easier to assemble, a lot cheaper to buy. But um, so basically, this tradition ascends to more upper classes, as you can see by this great stately hall. And around about this time of year, it, a massive log would be brought in and it would be absolutely huge because the idea that it has to burn throughout the whole 12 months, 12 weeks of Christmas. So essentially you'd end up with, in your hearth, this massive wood and eventually a swath and would push it in and push it in. Um, and that would have warmed the whole of your home. Not only to bring the warmth of sort of upper class um, winter celebrations of Christmas, but also again, it has that idea of of bringing a look to the home, to guarding your your hearts, which again, when I was talking about that idea of spirits and witches uh, bringing attack, your heart was the one that you mostly protected um, because it's the only space in your home which was open to the outside world. Other than you can shut the windows in front door, your heart was constantly open. So it was to to people in the past, it was um, essentially an easy attack. It was it was a, a space where um, anything could come through. So you would do winter traditions of blessing your heart through the, the Yule log. Um, other traditions as well, which you'd find in the heart is like witch marks, which are against witches. Um, witch bottles are found as well, which are um, bent needles or contained in bottles set to sort of bestow harm to a potential witch. Shoes are found in the hearth, which um, essentially was an act as a decoy. So mm -hmm. if a spirit was going to go after you, then they would sense your presence by the, the, the shoe. And again, just concentrate on that, then you yourself. So, and, so the hearth is quite um, a potential sort of place for home, and you bring in holly and ivy as well. Um, a lot of traditions bring in the holly and ivy, they'll grow up with the heart. Um, in Ireland, they keep a bit of holly um, and they use it to burn to, under their stoves to um, make their pancakes and stove juice out. So, going on to now is winter solstice and the winter folklore, and where all these traditions that are not so Jesus Christ and Mary as we as Christmas supposed to be. And in fact, some people say that Jesus Christ was actually born in October due to the shift of the, the um, Julian calendar to the modern calendar. Um, so these, stem, these traditions are bringing evergreens as well and, and that observance of this, the sun and that hope of returning stems a much older um, time. We see this within, although as tradition state, the only thing we know of of the ancient Celts or anything pre-Christian in Britain or Northern Europe is the mistletoe being one of them. We don't know much as to what they did as ceremony or, or tradition or custom or, or any kind of, if there was any deities that were sort of attached this time. However, we have ancient monuments that denote that the solstice <laughs> The solstices, which you have a summer solstice to know in the sun slowly becoming lower in the sky and the winter solstice becoming slowly, the sun starts becoming reaching to its highest point. We have like these monuments, um, one greatest of all, which um, I had the pleasure of visiting a few years ago is Newgrange in Ireland, uh, near the northern part of Ireland. And essentially this, it was grand really, to be honest. Um, it's a massive burial mound for essentially for the dead, um, for the resting place. And on the with, uh, midsummer morning, the sun rises through these passage frames here, 
and goes right into the middle of the cha chamber, the um, burial chamber, and where the essentially where the urns of the dead would have been. Um, today, like um, if you went in there, like you visit every day, they do like a stimulation, uh, which you can feel that experience of how if on the winter solstice how that light goes in there and that whole experience. Because today they there's a lot of demand to go down the winter solstice and they don't do it so much now. I think last one there where they said they do it on set special occasions like weddings, but it's like a, a long wait list of ten years or something like that. But now they do like a stimulation, which I would like to show since a lot of them are burial tombs, um, you know the place of were they dead basically, like um, as what we do with like, crematoriums or graveyards, you know, it's honouring their ancestors. And this time of the year, when I said again with this even recent beliefs of the dead and the fairies and the spirits are close this time, again, this belief will stem way, way back. Um, with this evidence of aligning these burial grounds to their dead uh, of the winter sun or the summer sun and they're illuminating like these these bur massive burial mounds almost like sort of bestowing illumination on their own ancestors themselves that that animation of the dead and it's not just that these plates it's not just new grange that has these alignments with the, the winter sun it's also stonehenge which again is was is perfectly known that people gather on their the summer solstice because the alignment of the stones and how they um, it moves and like the formations it makes, but also on the winter solstice, uh, the light shines on the central stone, which they known as the sacrificial stone or the the, the altar stone. The light shines upon that that main stone on the winter solstice, like. We also have some in Orkney, um, Mesestone? Mesestone. Mesestone, that's it. I'm not very good with pronunciation, so you go know, um, bear with me. But yeah, so Mesestone in Orkney and then Goslech Circle in Germany. Um, I believe there's other places as well, like um, in Egypt and um, Peru. Yeah. What was that, sorry? Apple Egypt. Oh, right, yes, with the alignment of the winter sun. Um, and somewhere in Peru as well has a similar alignment, but it, it's not so much um, like burial mounds or um, or stone circles. So next we'll mm. go on to this idea of like this naughty and nice. And I don't know if you've all noticed today I'm wearing my the most is the most Christmassy again, I'm afraid. It's very subtle. Yeah. Very <laughs> just, <laughs> um, it's my Krampus jumper I made actually. Almost three years ago, yeah. when I was at this college and we was doing a yeah, Christmas jumping yeah. competition, sadly I didn't win, but uh, I did spend time <laughs> making it myself. I bought it from a charity shop, this, and then I just sewed it. You on. put the most effort in of anybody with the yeah, Christmas was, jumper. Was it Gordon that won it? I think it was Gordon because he had like lights on his, and I was like, yeah. But that, this is as much like Christmas as I get, really, because <laughs> I'm a bit of a humbug, but if it comes to like traditions of like, Bring in in the green or even. I'm okay with You're that. You're okay with that. Um, but yeah, so this idea of naughty and nice comes from um, Swedish and, and Germanic um, Austrian traditions of Saint Nicholas. And Saint Nicholas was originally um, a Greek saint who was patron saint of children, sailors, but he was also um, renowned to being. Um, very wealthy, coming from a wealthy, his parents died at such a young age, um, so they left him a large amount of money. So he was known to sort of distribute certain money to the poor. He was also known as like sort of giving the nudge to other richer folks, giving charity to the poor. Um, and then later on the line, he becomes this kind of folk saint where. Um, it's not just money now, it's, it's, it's presents, it's, um, it's gifts and all, and even blessings as well, miracles, because one thing he was known as is to pray for great miracles, so he was known around this time of year, which is feast day is the 6th of December, which has just passed, 
uh, um, giving miracles on children that were blind or couldn't hear. And his counterpart is Krampus um, in parts of Germany, Austria again. Um, you would, St Nicholas would go around as a procession to the village and he would go to children that are nice, that have been good the year or are pleasant and give them gifts of like apples or sweets. Um, however, the ones that were known to be mischievous or naughty throughout the year would be under the hands of Krampus and he would then put them into this um, basket at his back. He would whip them with birch whip, which I've got on mine. <laughs> Every detail. Uh, he would chain them up. He would give them black coal, which is another symbol. It's like my parents used to say, oh, or if you don't go to all your gates coal in your, your stockings for the morning. Um, so it's that idea of coal. Um, some say he, that he boils bad children in boils like cauldrons of yeah. uh, boiling tar. Um, and these possessions originally would have been quite literal. So Those good poor children. Kids traumatized for the rest of their lives. Yes, yes. <laughs> like and they probably would be in a whipped by this character of, and you know, St. Nicholas I giving the treats. You were whipped. Yeah, in the area we had to go and go somewhere and he got me over here. Really? Yeah. Yeah, I was, I guess I was always very naughty as a child. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Maybe some areas still do it. Well, if I fail, I'll try and nick his whip and whip him back, so I'll be chasing him down the road. <laughs> I'd probably be the same. <laughs> I'd be like a pacifist, I'll go for it. But essentially, it still goes on to Dan. Um, and I guess it's more of a playful thing now. So it's it's a, it's sort of a, a memory of the past. And it's more of a playful, so the, the child is like chased or something instead of being whipped. But, so this is still a time where they're not essentially whipping the child. And that starts in the, the early, the late 1800s, early 1900s, the whole whipping. We, you, so you child. were living in the early 1900s then, for no, still, still <laughs> They still do it. Yeah. Really? Well, yeah. Hurting? <laughs> That's worrying. But they do, it doesn't hurt. <laughs> no. You get used to it when it's every year. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe certain, I think. It certain, didn't change me, I still be naughty. <laughs> <laughs> certain smaller towns probably um, still do it. But um, I think certainly in parts of Europe and Britain, mm -hmm. as more like child protection acts came out and child work. You know, these came to play of child abuse, so... Look at that. Wow. Muslim Santa Claus is alive. He's celebrated in the village of Vienna. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. And this is Austria in 1939. 34? 34. It's incredible. Wow. Have you ever seen this, Veronica? Mm, yeah. yeah. This pic, I mean, this film, it's, it's a lovely old bit of film. That's how it looks. Everybody dresses up in that way. Yeah. Incredible. Because Veronica's from there. Oh, what, what, what part? Um, it's on the border to Austria, Bavaria. Oh, right, okay. Separately on the border. And they still do these sort of traditions in St. Nicholas. Isn't that amazing? I know. Essentially, this would this person dresses up as Saint Nicholas, which sometimes would be your clergy or um, your priests, your local popes, would tend just to go to people of more poor families. Cheeky, I mean. Oh my yeah. gosh! <laughs> Did that happen to you? <laughs> Yeah, but more like a Yeah, so again, as you've seen, like, and you might have sort of guess, is that idea of Santa Claus or Sinti Claus, as they say in um, parts of Russia or Netherlands, stems from St. Nicholas <coughs> and as I think it becomes first a, a saint, that is a Greek saint, to then becoming a, a folk saint. 
Um, and this, this idea of the folk saint comes from a legend where um, this man who has three daughters is not very rich. Um, his oldest daughter is yet to be married, but he doesn't have money for a dowry or any money to support or for the wedding. So upon the feast day of St. Nicholas, the 6th of December, he put out his socks to sort of dry out um, over the fire. And St. Nicholas, as he's sort of passing the house, rooftops of houses, drops down a bag of coin, which then drops into the sock. And the morning after, the father of the, the three daughters finds out that this, is, this massive bag of coins went in the sock and was able to sort of afford to his oldest daughter to get married. And then it happened again, like with his second daughter. So by the third time, it's like, right, I'm going to find out who's doing these and dropping coins in. So he, for the third time when his daughter, third daughter goes to marry, the night before the feast day of St. Nicholas, he watches by this path and then sees St. Nicholas coming down and actually placing the coins this time into the sock. And he's like, haha, I've got you, I know who you are. And St. Nicholas says, makes him swear that he can have this money still for his third daughter to marry if he kept it his secret, his disguise secret and not told anyone. But, you know, like, villagers being villagers, they, he did tell people. Um, and the word spread out that on the eve of St. Nicholas, you know, um, he gives money to people that need it most. So then everyone starts putting socks out on the fireplace, like, on that eve. And that's where that tradition comes from, is this stocking. that stocking and putting um, treats in there. I mean... We didn't have presents, but we had, my mum used to just put a few little sweets, like candy cane and stuff, mm -hmm. or the half, um, well, it wasn't the half, it was more of a gas, 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 uh, yeah. gas fire, really, yeah. but it wasn't half, but she used to put, like, little things in. Mm -hmm. So then, again, like, so that image of St. Nicholas then verged on something more um, Germanic and Scandinavian, as this idea of it's not a person or a saint, but actually something more otherworldly as a, a gnome or an elf. And the first depictions of Santa Claus or Santa Claus is in um, the illustration with, along with Clement Moore's like poem, A Visit from St. Nicholas. And he was originally depicted as even wearing tan clothes or green and having like a big beard, of course, and like a holly, what do you have? Winter clothes, basically, or, or traditional dress of those of more a colder climate. Then the idea of like him being big and jolly and red and um, having toys um, as opposed to like fruits and little things comes from Thomas Nash, who illustrated this along with again republishing Clement Moore's um, poem, um, A Visit from St. Nicholas. And a lot of, there's a whole mythology that, you know, oh, the reason why it's red, red, red because of Coca-Cola's advert. And it's yes and no. Um, it's, it's really through Thomas Natch that illustrates him to be red, because it's going back to that idea of the Pope's clothes, which are traditionally would be red and loaned with fur, and no doubt loads of gold. And the Pope's a little bit more... Um, leaning now, he doesn't wear so much gold now to rub in people's faces, but um, but going back to that idea as well, but making him also the jolly creature of, of an elf or a father of an elf. And then again, Coca-Cola sort of holds onto this and like with the colour red, being Coca-Cola being their main colour, sort of reinforces that, that image of Santa Claus or um, Father of Christmas of being this big jolly red suited man that gives presents to children. We'll go on to next, so, but he's not the only person that sort of flies out of sleigh and, and has visited his children and gives them gifts or haunts the sky around this time of year. But you also have a character in Italy called uh, La Bethana and she is like a good witch that goes out um, to, Remember. Epiphany. Epiphany, yeah. During the Epiphany. 6th of um, January. 6th of January, get, like, and 6th of January, so after Christmas. Um, and she has a sack of 
like with toys and um, for those that are good she gives like toys, for those that are bad she just gives them a stick of wood or some black candy. Like, Traditionally cool but it turns yeah. into a sweetie that looks like cool. That's yeah. Like buy now. Again it's like that, re it's that reinventing that sort of not so harsh path to towards children. Mm -hmm. But the legend goes from this is Long ago, there was a woman that lived in a small town of Rome. Her name was La Balfena. She was an old woman, she was very house proud. She would sweep the house day and night. In fact, she would sweep the house that much that by the morning, she'd make a new broom, and then by the night time, the broom would be wear out. So she was constantly making a new broom <laughs> each day. Um, and she did this for most of her lot, old life until one day, three wise men came knocking on the door the same wise men that, that went to give their gifts to the uh, birth of Jesus and asked her if she would like to attend um, and to nurture the child of this, the, the king of the Jews. And she says to her, no, no, like, I've got way too much work to do. Like, this house takes a lot of work. It's day and night. It's a big business. So they're like, okay, yeah, we're okay, then no, no, no bother. Like, um, if you reconsider you just follow the star the northern star and you can be there so she goes back to work and she's like sweeping away and she's just as she's sweeping away she's just becoming less and less bothered about this housework and still thinking it's like well hang on no one's ever invited me anywhere everyone thinks i'm this wicked old woman a bit strange and, and, and a bit ocd by the sounds of it <laughs> way ocd um Maybe I should have offered it, like, taken up his offer and, and seen this newborn baby, the, the king of the Jews, his saviour. So then she goes off to Bethlehem, she follows the star, um, she attends the birth of Jesus Christ, and she witnesses the three wise men giving the gifts of, you know, frankincense, myrrh and gold. And she has quite a great time there, and I think when she returns back to her home, not only does she stop being worried about housework all the time, but she also spreads this message every year of the birth of Jesus Christ by giving children and um, gifts of things to remind them of the gifts that the three wise men gave to Jesus Christ. So then that essentially becomes like a folk legend now, mm. and people have in Italy, and I've seen it myself when I went, a few years ago when I went to um, Florence, People um, hang them up in their kitchen. Yeah. Uh, uh, little statues of La Bafana. Um, and it's, it's that folk legend there. But, and it's kind of playful. But back then, they would have believed it. So they would have believed that this, this spirit, this friendly witch, which back in the time, witches weren't so friendly, <laughs> you know, that would have been the person that gave ch children presents, then, then supposed to Santa Claus. But then, this, the symbology of of Santa Claus or Father Christmas um, goes far back. So the ideas of riding the night sky, reindeer, magical reindeers that carts them off, goes for this idea again, like, as I was saying about the whole idea of the spirit world being con like close around this time of year, it was believed that this thing called the wild hunt, and it would be, sometimes it would be like deities, uh, which were demonified uh, demonized by the, the church. Um, sometimes it would be um, the unseen court, which is like um, fairies. Sometimes it would just be spirits of the ancestors would ride down on this, with this main character and they would gather the souls of the dead that passed that year to where they need to go, whether it's hell, heaven, hell, purgatory limbo, wherever. Um, a lot of these places, these the main people, like the main character in this mythological belief, would have either been Odin or Wogan in parts of Germany or Scandinavia, Herne the Hunter in Windsor, Windsor Castle and Ground, uh, Gwyneth Nub on Glastonbury Tor, uh, our own, and then our own, um, in Scotland is Nick Niven, and she was said to be a fairy queen that rode out in the, with the Unseen Court, which is the, the court of fairies collecting the souls of those that passed of that year, or even taking people to their deaths. Mm. 
And it never is believed to believe, although a fairy queen, she said to be stemmed from the idea of a, a goddess um, of Irish pantheon, um, which is Nima. And she was like this, she was like a war goddess, but she was more like seen as the phantom scream and havoc for war. And that Nick Nevin means Nick, daughter and Nevin, so mm -hmm. daughter of Nevin. So the idea mm -hmm. that the fairy queen is daughter of this, this ancient goddess of Ireland uh, of war and sort of um, malevolence, really. Mm -hmm. And that concludes my, the end of my talk. Um, as you see, like these traditions that we see today, some of them fade in, some of them we create new. Um, but you know, this is why traditions are created. Like we hold on to these snippets of from our pagan past to our past of you know Catholicism, from our past of you know Protestantism to now our present day, where where our own beliefs and spirituality is more prominent. Um, and even new ones now, like like I said, the naughty owl. You know, what a lovely tradition. You know, and these traditions were didn't just come from nowhere, you know, it comes from us, the people, the folk. So and my idea, the this is why I'm sitting in this subject and sort of would like to get that out there and, and a lot of work in heritage is so important because it is us as the folk that through community, through our communications, if we lose these traditions, then we be, we get on the world of technology and and the communication and that community spirit that we used to have in the past. So it's okay to hold on to these old ones, your religious ones, and even create some new because this is how it happens. Like uh, you know, we're looking at the traditions that we meet today. Exactly. You used to come over like, oh, and this is how Naughty Elf came along, and, and now there's all sorts of bizarre, and there'll probably be more bizarre ideas, or ideas that they seem like to die, well, in the present, or in the future, see today as inappropriate and maybe different. So traditions create, are created, reinvented. Yeah, and, and fusions and, between and, different cultures. Yeah, and fusions between different cultures. And it's, it becomes this beautiful mixing part in which we call folk custom, folk belief, folk tradition. Yeah. Well, I um, would like to show our appreciation to yeah. Dash for <laughs> And so would anyone have any questions at all? Yeah, you know you were talking about these baubles in the Christmas tree. Oh yeah. To do the spirits and stuff. Yeah. I thought it was more to do uh, well, the shape of orbs. Oh, orbs. Yeah, I suppose in modern day you could you could represent them as orbs, as yeah. spirits, and sort of ward them off that one yeah. as well. I never knew about the, the witch's ball thing, when you yeah. introduced me to that, and that was a complete revelation. Um, so that's, that's fascinating. I, I love the talk because it gives you a connection with so many different cultures, not mm. only the traditions that we would recognize but how they connect with those of other countries mm -hmm. um and it was really good to have veronica's experience of something no, yeah, directly related to it i would love to witness that sort of the whipping i'd love to witness that sort of that procession go on like, it looks incredible oh no the good people I like yeah, festivals like also Bavarian streets and <coughs> the campuses are smoking and just taking naughty children out of the audience. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you, Bavarians, your place are. Yeah, yeah. just yeah, we'll a little bit. I suppose it goes to that idea as well, because we'll, I know. We all like have children have you know, bribe their children then it's like if you're not good then there's no presents or you'll get the whole and it's that way of like the whole month that parents can go, oh, I've got something I can just kind of make sure they're always behaving. <laughs> so it's it's a great idea. Yeah, like, yeah. Symbolic, symbolic way. Symbolic, yeah, yeah. The the uh, harm free way I'm in favour of. Um, but it, it's it introduces you to, to things you weren't familiar with. And actually, yeah. I don't know much about the Naughty Elf. What, when did that start and how do you incorporate it? In I don't know. I want to look up this because yeah. I think when, in your research, ethnology and, and folklore, 
it's always good to keep check of mm. things like this. Mm -hmm. Like when did it start? I mean, obviously, I think it's probably started from a corporate, corporate definitely. Mm -hmm. like so it's corporate something company. that's sold. You buy one? Yeah, so the normal yeah, out is like, it's through a company. I can't remember what company, I'll probably find out what company it is. Mm, I didn't know. Um, and you see them in Astra, and so you buy an Audi Alf. And now it comes with like, I think it started about five years ago. It's relatively new. Um, now you can get like jumpers for them. They're like that. And what's. Is it just like a doll figure? That yeah, you, I'll take that you. you I'll take the well, that's what I'm reading about. <laughs> so, and you, ha you have one? Yeah, I do. For my, because before they get to bed, like, and then obviously wake in the morning, I do all these scenarios with this this owl. Mm -hmm. Um, so I do it for my partner's kids, and they're just they're just like that, and they're quite small. Um, okay. They have got Valkyrie on the hands so you can attach them ah, from lights. I do and have doors. one of them. Yeah, so you do all sorts of scenarios. So you, you mean you move them around? Yeah. Like my like dad you... did that. He would make it appear. I mean, this was in the 60s. My dad did mm -hmm. that in, oh, in right. Canada. And the elf would appear at a different place each day. Oh, okay. He just simply moved it around. Also, maybe it's not. Maybe That's it's all he did. Else, yeah, but like... I don't know if there's a new version of it. Maybe. Um, I remember, like, I certainly, I mean, I'm from mid, the Midlands of England originally, and yeah. I certainly can't remember. You didn't have that tradition. No. It might be coming from North America, certainly, but I'm, I'm interested in that. It, it yeah. looks like it's a bit more of an elaborate version. But I yeah. read something the other day that I didn't know about called The Elf on the Shelf, and it apparently is a, it's like a CCTV with an elf oh, that's watching your yeah. kids. And I'm not sure about this one. I think no, it might be a bit, a bit sinister. It's a bit intrusive, isn't it? Yeah. I think it would be like that. Not, not, not that. Like that. Naughty elves, then, yeah. <laughs> but they, like, I can't remember. So they're not like that? <laughs> no, no. So you just, like that. you move it, you make so, it do yeah, different you things? Yeah, you make it do all sorts of different things. You might do, like, put in some um, toilet roll and roll it out and write a message saying, Hi, I'm back. Or, so it's it's oh, wow. portraying to the kids that this elf comes alive at night and yeah. does all this mischievous stuff, and they get, like especially my partner's kids, they they love it. Like every morning, they're like they get up and they're like, what's, what's the elf done now? Like I'm like, that's really that? interesting. You'd have to look around the house then. And so they, none they of you had that in your. No, I think that they put a big dog of something. Like that. No, I, <laughs> I don't remember being brought up with that name. So long as it's done in a lovely, gentle way. Yeah, it's, it's sinister. It's, I it's, haven't seen what you're describing. It's but playful way. I mean, I'll see if we can get some pictures. I presume my dad picked this up from us being living in Newfoundland. There were other people doing something with just one of those little elves and just moving it around. That's well, all that happened. Uh, and I still do that a wee bit. I thought you meant to. Well, it, it wasn't anything elaborate. It was simply that it appeared here and yeah, it appeared I there. Still have <laughs> Well, maybe that's probably, I mean, like I said, it's always good to record traditions yeah. and where they're starting from now. Yeah. Then sort of like years on my head, like 50 years and probably like, where's the origins of this? Yeah. Um, and record it now, like, or now, like, like it's, maybe it does come parts of North America we and didn't, Canada. There was nothing like that with ideas of having to yeah, do different got, things. I mean, to be honest, sometimes I have my own ideas yeah. and then sometimes I get I stuck and like, what can I do now? So I'm like... Not enough ideas. So you might have him with a pen and like a message, or wow. you might have him like have him hand in candy, or buy some scissors, or That's or in bed with Barbie. In you know, bed with Barbie. I don't know about that. Um, <laughs> that some of them are quite annoying. Like I think probably adults do it. I can themselves. imagine some but of the like things, things like come... that are quite innocent like this. So it's like you get some like um. You know, some flower on the surface, you do that, and it makes it look like him and Barbie and at the night doing snow angels. Making snow angels. So you do all sorts of things. I mean, I have to Google it all the time because I run out of ideas. Yeah. So, but... Oh, well, good for you. Now I was like, oh, I don't have no idea. I'm like, well, you just going to have to see where it is. Huh? Like, this morning, then they went home to their mum, and we just had him by hanging from the blind, with the blind half open and hanging from the blind. I'm like, oh... But in, in a happy way. Yeah, in a happy way. No, no, not happy from the day. It's rather than swinging, it's sort of like <laughs> bungee sure. jumping from the blind. Okay, that's alright. And I'm like, oh, that's a bungee jump from the blind. It's like I opened up trying to wake you up. Oh, so, geez. but yeah, like maybe it is like, but I don't, 
maybe it's like a, a game and it's nice that these mm. these cultural traditions come in and we sh we are able to share that and maybe reinvent them as well well there you go i just thought it was my dad yeah <laughs> not, not nobody else did it because i haven't met anybody else well, I thought we all used to have a pretty big tune of our Well, yeah, you would. <laughs> maybe, maybe like, you yeah. could ask your friends back in Canada and stuff. Yeah, I'll have to ask my, my relatives who still live there. Yeah. They do. That would be interesting. Yeah. I'd like to, because I always thought it's brought through corporate company because the company sells now. Well, it no doubt has become yeah. commercialised. Yeah. But I, I really don't think it was then. Because they made them look like very. You know the 1950s dolls? Mm, mm. Like, yeah, ours yeah, is yeah. a bit like that, yeah. quite pointy and long and thin and fel felty with the, with the Velcro. Yeah. So you can hang it onto things. You've That's got right. Velcro for hands on that. I still do stockings. Mm -hmm. um, I still do stockings. A lot of people I know don't do them anymore, but mm -hmm. I still believe in having Christmas stockings. <laughs> I think it's it's great. Like, I mean, I always have a tradition myself where I'd, I'd bring on the eve of Christmas, well, not the eve of Christmas, the eve of the first, sorry, mm -hmm. I bring in the holly and the ivy and, mm. you know, this year I like, I sang with the kids like, the holly and the ivy. Quite right. <laughs> I went to bore you with the song, I'm a great oh, singer. I love it. But um, I have little traditions and I think it's important that we carry them on because yeah. otherwise they become like relics of the past and mm. instead of like... Yeah, just like you Yeah, that's it. Well, look how the Gaelic language is. Like, it's, it's constantly reinventing itself. It's, it's constantly being supported now by Scottish Parliament and being part of the, the you know, the, the Gaelic medium for schools. You know, it, it's, it's great to hold on to it. these things. Otherwise, do we, otherwise they become like, as much as I love museums, but all the, they just become things of relics mm -hmm. of the past that we look mm -hmm. and think, mm, I wish I could enjoy these myself, but. No, but do, doing don't. these things as you do, and, yeah. and maybe some of you do as well, it's, it connects you with the parts of your yeah. childhood that you want to remember. Um, it connects you with your family, maybe the culture that you used to live in, if you've yeah. moved away from that. A lot of communities try to recreate these things, even if they emigrate to other places. Um, yeah. They will try to carry on and reinvent, as we've talked about with other festivals and how Halloween evolved and changed in, in North America and how you got pumpkins instead and mm -hmm. so on. We've, we've had a good exploration of that, but today's been a brilliant way to, to look at it in midwinter and the Christmas terms. So. Yeah, I think you think somebody else to the house. Yeah, maybe, maybe, the, uh, maybe they're all naughty elves. Let's think of them that way tomorrow. You're just a bunch of naughty elves, all of you. <laughs> Thank you. So, looks like that, and they're quite small. Um, okay. They have got Valkyrie on the hands, so you can attach them from ah, lights. I do have doors. one of them. Yeah, so you do all sorts of scenarios. So you, you mean you move them around? Yeah. Like my dad you... did that. He would make it appear. I mean, this was in the 60s. My dad did mm. that in, oh, in right. Canada, and the elf would appear at a different place each day. Oh, okay. He just simply moved it around. Also, maybe it's not. Maybe That's all it's he did. Smart, but like, I don't know if there's a new version of it. Maybe. Um, I remember I, I certainly, I mean, I'm from mid, the Midlands of England originally, and yeah. I certainly can't remember. You didn't have that tradition. No. It might be coming from North America, certainly, but I'm, I'm interested in that. It, it yeah. looks like it's a bit more of an elaborate version. But I yeah. read something the other day that I didn't know about called The Elf on the Shelf. And it apparently is a, it's like a CCTV with an elf that's oh, watching your yeah. kids. And I'm not sure about this one. I think no, it might be a bit, a bit sinister. It's a bit intrusive, isn't it? Yeah. It's, it's a children. I think you'd be like, we didn't I mean, have that. Not, not that. Oh, no. Naughty elf, then, yeah. <laughs> But they, like, I can't remember. So they're not like that? <laughs> no, no. So you just, like that. you move it, you make so, it do yeah, different you things? Yeah, you make it do all the different things. You might do like putting some um, toilet roll and roll it out and write a message saying, hi, I'm back. Or, so you, it's, it's oh, wow. portraying to the kids that this elf comes alive at night and yeah. does all this mischievous stuff. And the, like, especially I mean, with a pen and like, a message or wow. you might have it like have a hand in candy or buy some scissors or, or in bed with Barbie. In yeah. bed with Barbie, I don't know about that. Um, <laughs> that some of them are quite annoying, like I think probably adults do it. I can sounds. imagine some but of the things, like things like that are quite innocent like this, so it's like 
you get some oil, um, you know, some flour on the surface, you do a bar, and it makes it look like him and Barbie and at the night with some snow angels. Making snow angels. So you do all sorts of things, I mean I have to, maybe it is like, but I don't, maybe it's like a, again, and it's nice that these, mm. these cultural traditions come in and we, sh we are able to share that. And maybe reinvent them as well. Well, or... there you go. I just thought it was my dad. Yeah. <laughs> not, not nobody else did it. Because I haven't met anybody else here. Well, I don't know this. So I'll be pretty future. Oh, well, yeah, you would. <laughs> maybe, maybe like, you could yeah. ask your friends back in Canada and stuff. Yeah, I'll have to ask my, my rel relatives who still live there. Yeah. Yeah. They do. That would be interesting. Yeah. I'd like to. Because I always thought it's brought through corporate company because the company sounds now. well it no doubt has become yeah. commercialized yeah but I, I really don't think it was no. then because they've made them look like very you know the 1950s dolls mm, mm. Like, yeah, ours is a bit like point. that yeah. quite pointy and long and thin and fel felty with the, with the velcro yeah so you can hang it onto things You've that's got right velcro hands on that. i still do stockings Mm -hmm. um, I still do stuff. A lot of people I know don't do them anymore, but mm -hmm. I still believe in having Christmas stockings. <laughs> I think it's it's great. Like I mean, I always have a tradition myself where I'd, I'd bring and the eve of Christmas, well not the eve of Christmas, the eve of the first. Sorry, mm -hmm. I bring in the holly and the ivy, and mm. I have little traditions, and I think it's important that we carry them on because yeah. otherwise they become like relics of the past, and mm -hmm. instead of like yeah, just like no. Yeah, that's it. Well, look how the Gallic language is. Like, it's it's constantly reinventing itself. It's it's constantly being supported now by Scottish Parliament and being part of the, the you know the, the Gallic medium for schools. You know, it, it's it's great to hold on to it. these things. Of ways, do we? Always they become like as much as I love museums, but all the, they just become things of relics mm -hmm. of the past that we look mm -hmm. and think. Mm, I wish I could enjoy these myself, but no. But do, doing don't. these things as you do, and, yeah. and maybe some of you do as well. It's it connects you with the parts of your yeah. childhood that you want to remember. Um, it connects you with your family, maybe the culture mm -hmm. that you used to live in. If you've yeah. moved away from that, a lot of communities try to recreate these things, even if they emigrate to other places. Um, yeah. They will try to carry on and reinvent as we've talked about with other festivals and how Halloween evolved and changed in, in North America and how you got pumpkins instead and mm -hmm. so on. We've we've had a good exploration of that. But today's been a brilliant way to, to look at it in midwinter and the Christmas terms. So uh, I think she thinks of the else and then Yeah, maybe maybe the uh, maybe they're all naughty elves. Let's think of them that way tomorrow. You're just a bunch of naughty elves, all of you. Thank you.